Hi guys, welcome to the second video in a series looking at vintage integrated circuits and for this video we look at the General Instruments SBO256 which is really written SP0256, that's just not the way we say it. It must be around a decade or so ago now I bought this book, the PIC Microcontroller Project Book by John Iovine, if I pronounce that correctly, I don't know. But I never actually built any projects out of it, it was just for reference. But today that's about to change. And I feel a little bit dirty making something like a kit, because once you design your own things it's kind of pointless. But I've done it the old fashioned way, traced out the schematic with my connections. Uh, my project is a little bit different, I'm using the PIC 16 f 628 a in place of the 84, which are kind of probably both obsolete. The 3.12 MHz crystal that the SPO256 is spec'd for is a little hard to come by now, so I'm using a more commonly available 3.57 MHz crystal. The hardware side of the project from the book doesn't differ greatly from the SPO256 datasheet as can be seen here. In summary, the SPO256 is a chip developed by General Instruments in the early 80s. It's designed to reproduce all of the individual sounds produced by the human vocal tract and in combination with a microcontroller sequence these sounds to form words and sentences. The main I.O. of interest is an address load pin, which when pulled low will cause the chip to load a value on its address bus, representing the sound to make. A standby pin is held low by the SPO256 whenever it's making a sound so that your microcontroller program knows how long to hold off before sending the next value to make up a word. As with some of my other projects that are specifically done for YouTube, I'll be using a crappy board that I want to get rid of. This one's too flexible. And to preserve my vintage General Instruments chip for collection, I'll be using a much cheaper and more commonly available microchip branded SBO256. And the first board done. The LM386 can directly drive a small speaker. From here I should be able to directly enter the example program that comes in the book using PIC Basic Compiler and end up with an example code that speaks a couple of phrases. Ba -bow. In short, it's never a good idea to use a couple of narrow dip sockets to make a single wide socket. The chip does fit snugly but tightly hugs the inside wipers which aren't connected to the pins underneath and uh, does not connect reliably. But that's not the worst of it, it turns out my chip is fake, and every chip that looks like this claiming to be an SBO256 is fake. These are all real ones, and this photo was provided by Tim Stoddard, who also has a YouTube channel. Tim was also kind enough to provide me with this vintage example, which I didn't want to do this to. It was supposed to stay in my collection, but I guess I've made the mess now. Once I'd removed my dodgy socket arrangement, there was no other choice other than patience waiting for a proper one to arrive. Just backing up a little for now to my last vintage integrated circuit video, which was also the first, and probably two or three videos behind on my channel at the moment. It was focused on the RCA 2500E 7 segment display decoder. It was designed for a Numatron display. It might be worth checking that one out if you haven't seen it already to put the rest of this video into context because this counter is involved uh, in this video. Although this decoder is designed for a Numatron display, I'd only gotten up to connecting it to a common anode 7 segment LED display because this vintage Numatron display had not yet arrived in the mail from eBay, but now it has. I did anticipate that I'd want to try a Numatron display, so the 7 segment display was mounted temporarily so that it could be removed, and the time has come to remove it. The eBay listing for the Numatron display did come with some photos in the listing of its data sheets, which would help work out how it is connected, uh, but I didn't really have to bother. There are annoying differences between the way that a 7 segment LED display is documented, so being able to clearly see the common anode inside the Numatron display straight through the glass, I decided to try every other pin through trial and error to work out where the segments were supposed to be connected. It didn't hurt to have the other display to help. 
And here it is counting away. This isn't the easiest thing to record on video, uh, but I have found better ways than I have done in this segment. One other change I've made to the counter circuit is increasing the size of the capacitor used to govern the timing of the 555 circuit to make it closer to a second interval. In the previous video, the counter was much faster than this and couldn't be adjusted to be made this slow. Here's my best attempt at a still photo to maybe use as a YouTube thumbnail. Back to the SBO256 circuit, I have the example program loaded and ready to go. Using a couple of buttons in combination can produce a couple of example phrases. The data sheet for the SBO256 comes with a dictionary of words to help save you the trouble of stringing together a bunch of allophones to make words. These are some of the spoken numeric examples that I've included into the program to play in the next segment. I'm not sure what to think really. It's cute and it would be great in a retro project, but I think I would have been disappointed at the time in the day if I'd brought and used one of these. With the Numatron display up and running, I guess there's no longer a need for the 4511 display decoder board. It provided an identical display and was only really used to debug the first circuit board. I did save the 7805 regulator and moved that over to the far right circuit board because I still want to power this from a battery. But as a whole, uh, the thing's a lot tidier now. Recall that this project had a 4-bit output for the binary count, which can be seen just to the right of the Numatron display. I can't imagine too much practical use for a device that speaks a bunch of numbers in sequence, but what if we were to split those numeric sequences into subroutines and receive a 4-bit input from a port and then speak those numbers according to a value received on that port? Obviously that's what I've gone ahead and done and the buttons on this board no longer do anything at all. This obviously requires some change to the example program which you can go ahead and pause and slow-mo if you like, but essentially it waits for a change on the port and speaks the value received as a binary input uh, whenever the port state changes, which will happen when the counter decrements. And this is how it all looks connected together. The SBO256 board is powered from the same 7805 regulator as the rest of the project counter was. Eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one, zero, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two. Still, I can't imagine too much practical use for a device that displays and speaks a countdown, but what if we used it to automate the launch of a pocket rocket motor? I think that'd be a little bit more fun and I happen to have a couple spare. These things have a fuse element, basically resistance wire shoved up their butt, uh, that heat up when current is passed through it, thus igniting the rocket and causing it to take off. I'll demonstrate that right now in low light with a couple of AA batteries. The resistance wire does take some time to heat up, so I imagine the rocket wouldn't launch exactly when the counter reached zero. This is essentially a freestyle project made up as I go along. If you keep your eye where the arrow is pointing, you'll notice that my carry output acts on the 9 digit. This made sense as a standalone counter so that several counters in theory could be cascaded to make a multi-digit counter. Unlike an up counter where we would send the carry output for zero, a down counter should send the carry output for nine to successively clock the preceding digits in the display. Another way that I can show you my carry output for 9 is simply to push a button that I forgot about which stops the counter. So you can see the carry output red LED lit while I hold the button down and when I release it the count will continue and the carry output will turn off. 
Rather than adjust the counter circuit to trigger at zero, which could be done with a bunch of NOR gates, we have a microcontroller now that already knows the value of the counter, so we might as well make it output the trigger pulse at zero. The output trigger pulse, which occurs at a zero count, will be sent to this board, which contains very little. It's an IRF 540N MOSFET, which will switch on the fuse wire, but for now I'm using an incandescent bulb for testing. The launch pad board is as simple as this, and it uses the MOSFET to switch current from a separate battery supply through the incandescent light bulb for now. Switching a separate battery supply through the fuse wire will allow me to use high current without worrying about depriving the rest of the circuit so that it might not function correctly. I didn't even notice that red 10mm LED was an auto flasher when I grabbed it, but that'll do. For those of you in Australia familiar with Dick Smith, this is where this is from, so that's how long I've had some of this stuff sitting around. Here we have the whole setup with modified software ready for the first test. And lift off! It's still talking and counting away there, so I'm thinking perhaps I should make it shut up after the zero. It will only do the launch after the second zero, so I can turn it on and it doesn't really matter where the counter starts. The launch pad PCB has been set up properly now, and I'm considering fixing up a rocket motor with fins and a cone so that it'll fly properly. Uh, the motor on its own will just spin around and go somewhere but won't really fly. We won't be able to see this anyway because it's really hard to track on camera from prior experience. I mentioned I'd have been disappointed had I used the SBO256 for a real project back in the day and that's because one, they've always been expensive and secondly, of the three people I played the See You Next Tuesday sample to, none of them recognised that phrase until I told them what it was. I'm certainly looking at it through different eyes now and can have fun with it. And one final modification to software that I've already alluded to, uh, it will only speak the significant countdown. It'll keep counting after that, but it's the last we'll actually hear from it. Okay, it's 4.20am and I've constructed a bit of a rocket using some bits of the back cover of the book we started with. I'm no expert at this, but I've seen a similarly constructed rocket take off and fly successfully. Even for the recording of this voiceover narration, I've caught up to the rest of the video and uh, it's my bedtime. Well, I hope you enjoyed that. I did. I've got one more rocket motor left, and next time I'd like to try tracking the rocket with multiple cameras. Uh, and also for the next video, I'd like to try a different kind of counter, and that's why I'm keeping this rig for now. Catch us next time. One type of encoder is a rather simple circuit of four OR gates with the input designed to receive the decimal numerals, one at a time. Each is converted to a four-bit binary combination
which can be stored. Two, for example, is encoded as 0010. Seven comes through this way. Zero input does not have to go through the gates. The output will be 0000 when there is zero input.